I think there's always people in transition. And I think actually if you can offer an apartment on the eighth of the month rather than the first, you might pick up a tenant that somebody else, that the other buildings can't pick up, right? Because they're just not on that schedule, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, I'm not saying you want to have all of them, you know, in the middle of the month, but I think if you can stagger them, I think there's advantages to it. And I also found it very interesting that um, typically when I had uh, properties that opened up in the middle of winter, like let's say January 15th and it's 20 below outside, and I'm either going to rent rent that, re-rent that property or I'm going to sell that property, I had better results then than I had in June because I had no competition. Nobody else was, there was nothing else available to rent. There was nothing turning. There was nothing else available to buy. There was, the market was thin. It is a common saying amongst real estate investors that you make money when you buy, not when you sell. While this catchy phrase has value, it fails to convey how easy it is to lose money through poor property management. Whether you self-manage or hire a professional, it is important to understand how to navigate the common pitfalls and challenges with rental properties without losing your shirt or your mind. That's why you have tuned in to Maximizing Your Property Value, the apartment owner's guide to operating rental properties as a successful business. I'm your host, John Stiles, real estate agent and team leader of the VIP Real Estate Group at Bridge Realty. As a current multifamily investor and former property manager myself, I understand the headaches and difficulties of keeping an investment property from becoming a money pit and time sucker. It takes a solid business plan. It takes tested systems and it takes key team members to actually find success. So let's take a deep dive and maximize your property value. All right. Welcome back, everybody, to another episode of Maximizing Your Property Value. I am your host, John Stiles. I'm very excited to have with me in studio, David Peters. David, how are you doing today? Good, John. Thanks for inviting me. I really appreciate the opportunity to, to share my knowledge with people. Wonderful. I'm looking forward to this conversation. Um, David is uh, an entrepreneur who started as an engineer and over the years has built and repositioned multiple businesses in different industries. So he has a kind of a wide breadth of knowledge in different types of businesses. Uh, that being said, he has a large focus on real estate investing, uh, lots of experience with smaller uh, one to four unit properties and, and uh, more recently um, in larger commercial deals and uh, new construction and development opportunities. So it's going to be a really uh, interesting conversation here. Uh, David, why don't you take a moment and just kind of fill in some of those gaps about kind of where you started in business and, and where you've developed till today. Sure. Thanks, John. Yeah, actually, I started out in corporate America like a lot of people do. Uh, I became an electrical engineer out of college and started with a company called Alliant Tech Systems, actually doing military weapons design. But uh, I found that it was a very structured, tight environment that didn't allow for a lot of my creativity. So I, I left there uh, in the 90s and formed a, an IT company, which was, you know, pretty opportunistic. I think it was the right time. It, the Internet was just coming out. I uh, did that for about eight years, built up an organization, multi-million dollar revenue, 12 employees, and decided uh, to exit in the early 2000s because it seemed like the right time to get out and uh, sold the business to, to my employees. Then I went in to uh, help a friend turn around a power sports business that he had that was struggling. We had to rebuild a, a supply chain in China and do some design changes and all kinds of stuff to get them back on track and managed to do that. Then I uh, did some did some things in the financial area. I actually helped a friend try to take a, a dot-com company public. We almost got there but didn't quite because the timing was a little late. And uh, from, from there, I actually moved into real estate. It was kind of interesting how I got into real estate because... I started out, I had a friend who was uh, very interested in uh, having a general contracting business. He knew how to build anything and everything, and I knew how to run businesses. So we kind of combined our skills. You know, I had the, the strength of business, and he had the strength of uh, industry knowledge, and we came together and started a business where we would do full remodels for uh, people who were flipping houses. This was 2004, 2005. You know, and the market was very hot, tons and tons of people doing it. And that uh, really took off for about four years until all of our customers basically went bankrupt. 
you know, they collapsed in the 2008. So that was when I actually decided to start buying the, the property and become the real estate investor. You know, we started out doing a lot of flips. Uh, there was plenty of stuff available. Of course, almost every street corner had something. And, and that was that was great, but I found it was not very tax efficient. So that was when I decided, okay, let's let's start holding single families for rentals and small multifamilies for rentals. And did that for, for several more years until probably about 2016. I just kind of got the itch that maybe apartments was, was a better investment multifamily. So I went through several different training programs, got connected to a lot of people. And it actually was kind of a slow transition. It took me a while. I uh, got involved in uh, several deals kind of on a, on a minor role. I was never the, the lead guy. And uh, moved that forward, started consulting with a lot of people, uh, became sort of a, an expert on analyzing these deals because I, I was able to incorporate my business sense and my planning background, you know, actually having business planning experience and things like that to add a lot of value to those deals for other people. And uh, the more I did it, the more I got recognized for it. And so then I actually started doing uh, consulting for passive investors who would come to me and say, hey, I want you to look at these 10 deals and help me figure out, you know, which deal was the best and why and what the likely outcomes would be. And and if if they, you know, if they believe the projections of the, the, the syndicators and things like that. And uh, about a year ago, I started looking into development. And that's where I met uh, a gentleman named Jerome Myers in Greensboro. And uh, Jerome and I started talking, and he found a, an opportunity zone piece of land that we were then able to get under contract and get rezoned up so that we're able to build 120 units there. And that's that's one of the big projects we're still working on is I'm finding uh, development work doesn't happen in three months, you know, right. tons and tons of approval process and, and just it's just a very slow process. But we're making really good process progress on that. And uh, about six months ago, I actually came across an opportunity to utilize uh, failing hotels as an asset because multifamily has been so expensive, it's been very difficult to actually find anything that makes sense, especially if you're looking at the syndication model, you know, because it just is the syndication model. You do have to provide uh, better returns and you need to um, be able to meet all the all the pieces, whereas, you know, if someone comes in and buys it themselves, they can eliminate a lot of those those cost points. So uh, we, we started looking at hotels and thinking, well, you know, these assets are, are failing and they're inexpensive. What could we do with them? And that's where we came up with the model of converting them from, you know, daily rentals to essentially weekly and monthly rentals, but, uh, you know, short-term housing, furnished housing, but for uh, people who needed a, a place to stay for a period of time, let's say they're transitioning from job to job, let's say they're they're in town for three months because of job training or maybe school or traveling nurses or construction workers. And the more we looked into it, the more we found, wow, there's a huge space here. And right now, what are those people doing? Well, they're going to an extended stay hotel and paying, you know, $70 a night. And if they stay a week or a month, they get a 10% discount. So still pretty expensive. Whereas if we bought it and positioned it exactly to be just a ho you know a, an extended stay version of a hotel, we can cut a lot of expenses. Therefore, we can provide a better product at a lower price. And there's a lot of these available for acquisition. So, so we've got uh, one operating now. Uh, one here we're looking at under contract, and another one we're close to being under contract on in in Moorhead. So I'm really excited about actually you know assuming that the model works out going uh, uh, actually to create sort of a franchise brand out of it, maybe get 20, 30, 50 of these operating and starting in the Midwest and branching out from there. Okay. So that's a really long explanation of a short question. No, well, that's, that's really interesting, all the different experiences that you've had and kind of your ability to, you know, position or pivot as the market changes. Uh, you know, you've seen a few different market shifts along the way here. Yeah, yeah, I think it's really, um, it's important as an entrepreneur and an investor to uh, be willing to, to look ahead to try to, to lead rather than follow. I mean, I think there's there's a time, you know, like, um, ideally, a lot of people, you know, if I, if I had redone it now, I probably would have gotten into multifamily sooner, maybe 2011, 2012, and, and rode that out for a period of time. But, you know, it's kind of, uh, as people discover spaces, they become more and more crowded, and really, I think that the time that you want to 
be thinking about an exit from that space is when everybody else is trying to get into it. Yeah. You know, and, and then you want to, but, but then when you exit, you have to find somewhere else to go, right? And so that's kind of what we're, we're hoping we found with the, the uh, hotel conversion to, to short-term housing, that we're going to be able to ride this space for a while. And, and this is kind of an interesting one because uh, if, if you look at analysis, you know, in, in uh, like, like what happens when, if a recession comes, everybody's talking recession, recession, and nobody can really predict when, right? But everybody thinks sooner than later. Um, I think uh, these properties, if you're looking at who's going to be staying there, I mean, the likelihood is that that business probably will get stronger because there'll be more people in transition in a recession, right? If people have to change jobs to keep their income, you know, if people end up, you know, losing their homes, unfortunately, and need a place to, to bridge till they can till they can settle somewhere, right? You know, there's there's a lot of scenarios within a recession where you may have more demand for this type of housing rather than less. Yeah, yeah, I mean that's one of the strengths of multifamily and why it's so attractive to so many is that it's good in a bad economy and it's good in a good economy. <laughs> right, so. right. And we're kind of a, in the space that we're in, we're really in a hybrid because, you know, we're kind of in between that traditional hotel and in between that traditional multifamily because we're essentially providing housing that usually looks like a few weeks to maybe six months. Okay. Well, that's neat. Um, so in this show, what we what we want to focus on is kind of – the business planning and mindset around managing these assets or, you know, mostly I've been talking about multifamily, but obviously it can apply to the hotel industry and, and others. Um, but just trying to help uh, owners and users um, to think critically about how they're approaching their business rather than just kind of, I think a lot of people when they initially get into uh, real estate investing, there's not much planning that goes into it. And they kind of just gunslinging as you will and shooting down problems and then you kind of get overwhelmed with there's so many different problems and then eventually these assets get become distressed assets without that you know strategic planning so while that distressed asset is a great opportunity for you and I uh, we want to try to help people avoid getting into that situation so sure so um, what I want to do is is kind of focus in on your experience um, with the small multifamily properties. And so with that, um, can you tell us a little bit about the structure of, of your management? Have you managed these properties in-house? Have you hired a third party? Or how does that work for you? Actually, I have, uh, I have an assistant, a full-time assistant. I think that's one of the just from not even from like a multifamily standpoint, but just from a business standpoint in general, I think as the entrepreneur, as the owner, you should always be thinking, you know, what's your uh, best and highest use of your time, right? And I found that, you know, it wasn't easy to say, okay, I'm going to commit, you know, $50,000 a year to have a personal assistant. But the leverage that that gave me allowed me to produce, you know, $100,000, $200,000 more of results every year because I have someone who I can, you know, train and task with a lot of those things and take things off my plate. And he's he's now, you know, I our, our small portfolio that we have here of, of single and small multis locally, he's actually the, the key contact on, on all of that. So uh, he, he's someone who I was able to train. I think, I think on management is a little bit different on the small multis than it is on like the big ones. But I think in principle, it, it's still the same. I mean, ultimately, you want to be able to keep the properties well maintained, keep the communication really good with your with your tenants, and you know, basically provide good service to your tenants. Right? You want to have good turnaround times. And I think uh, what I see, I guess, for the small investor, a lot of times is maybe they get to five, six, eight, ten houses, right? And maybe they're still working a W two job. I mean. I think that they think, well, you know, I can manage this myself and I can save the cost to that management company or whatever. But ultimately, you're not really saving money because you're going to you're going to not get the things done you need to get done on the property. The property is probably going to, you know, if it goes vacant, it's going to stay vacant longer because the turnaround times are going to be slower. You know, I think having the right people in the right positions, you know, and and as the investor, should you really be the one you know, doing that day-to-day -day management. I, I argue that you should know your tenants when you're at that point, you know, 
I mean, when you're when you're small and scaling up, you should know your tenants and make and make sure that you ultimately make the decisions on screening them, deciding who's in and who's out. But beyond that, I think that really, you know, if you can train someone else who you know, you know, has your best interests in mind, who you can trust, I think you want to, you know, offload that that part of the management piece. For, for you, um, did you hire your assistant right away when you started to hold these um, single families that you were flipping? Or, you know, at what point, how many did you manage yourself before hiring an assistant on that? I had 15 that I managed myself before I, before I hired an assistant. But I guess I have to qualify that because I had the construction company and he was my project manager in the construction company. So he made a natural transition as we ramped down the construction activity and just ramped up the the uh, buy and hold activity, essentially, the maintenance activity. Yeah. So it was a very natural transition. And, and it helped that, you know, when we went out to places, he was with me all the time. So the transition was just very natural because my tenants, my existing tenant base, and I tend to keep my tenants really long. I mean, my current tenant base, I haven't had any turnover in four years. And my longest tenant, I think, is... She's at seven years now, and she said she wants another 12. <laughs> so, so I'm really fortunate that way because definitely, in these, especially in the single-family space, the biggest single expense is turnover. Mm-hmm. I mean, it's huge. You know, the lost revenue, um, it can cost you anywhere from 1500 to $5,000 to turn a single-family, depending upon the condition it's in and where you want to take it, you know, between tenants. I mean... It's it's much different than an apartment where it's like, you know, clean paint, you know, maybe five hundred to a thousand dollars, right? And you can turn it over in a, a week, maybe even, you know. So yeah, I think definitely having that resource that you can count on is gonna help you grow. Now obviously if you have two rentals, you can't do it, right? I mean you pretty much have to manage it yourself. But I think that um communication with the tenants is really key. I've seen different kinds of tenants. Some tenants will complain about everything, which, you know, people say, oh, that's terrible. But actually that's good because you keep things maintained that way, right? And others you won't hear from for years, right? But all that dripping sink, I just put it, you know, I I put a bucket under there and all the heat, well, I just turned it up higher because the furnace wasn't working real well. You know, it's like, you don't want that because that's where you lead to, you know, big repair bills potentially if they're not, things aren't maintained or a leaking roof, right? You know, oh, we'll just put a bucket here and we'll tell them about it next year, you know, whatever. <laughs> so right, okay. So so you've had uh, your assistant largely managing these rentals, and so with that, what is your what has your involvement been there? Do you just kind of check in on a weekly basis? Do you uh, what does your involvement look like or that relationship? Well, see, he and I have have built synergy over. He's been with me now five years. So he just kind of knows what to do, and he knows when to check back with me, right? And we've converted all of our tenants over now to automatic pay. So basically the first of the month, I just pull up the bank account and see if they made their deposits. And and so it, it tends to flow pretty well, and fortunately, you know, I mean, obviously the average person might not have that same level of success, right? You know, so I think um, it, it kind of depends on, on where you're at. But for me, I I generally don't check. I check every month to make sure the rent is paid. And he'll my assistant will tell me if there's any issues that need to be addressed. But otherwise, I'm off working on this bigger stuff now sure. all the time. And he's actually kind of transitioning into that area, helping me with that now too. Okay. So, Yeah, I know that uh, you're kind of phasing out of the smaller properties. Um, and, uh, but how have you had systems or processes in place so that, you know, things don't get missed? Like you mentioned that sometimes tenants don't report things that they should. Um, and, and as you're taking kind of your eye off of the property and allowing somebody else to take the lead on it, how do you make sure that, you know, there's follow through and how do you make sure that things don't get missed? Well, I think typically the way we try to work it is we have periodic inspections. He goes over there for certain pre-described reasons. Like, for instance, we do, you know, furnace maintenance periodically, you know, like changing filters and checking the furnace and things like that. We do that a couple times a year. We do uh, smoke detector checks, okay, just just so he gets the chance to get in the property. And hopefully, you know, we try to he tries to schedule at a time when it's likely that he'll run into 
the tenant, right? So he won't do it at noon if they're going to be at work, right? Because he actually wants to say, hi, how are things going, right? And I also do check in probably every 60 days. I may give the tenant a call and just say, hey, is everything okay? You okay. know, just, just to check in with them. You know, that's not perfect. I think it's actually his visits are more valuable than my check-ins because they may just say, oh, yeah, everything's fine, right? You know, and they won't even think about whatever. I mean, they're they're thinking about, you know, Christmas shopping or something. They're not thinking about the sink that's leaking upstairs. It's been leaking for six months. So, <laughs> right. so yeah, I mean, he goes in and he, he does a quick check of the whole property when he when he's doing those those maintenance. And I think that's that's the best way. And, I mean, fortunately, my tenants have not ever really pushed back. Some tenants will push back on privacy. They'll say, hey, you know, why do you have to come in here every three months to walk through the house? You know, everything's fine, blah, blah, blah. We don't, you know. It kind of depends, but... But uh, in general, I think my tenants have just been really uh, easygoing in that in that regard. So I've never had any issues with them, you know, pushing back on him going in and doing his maintenance. Yeah. Well, yeah, I think that is really important, whether it's yourself or, you know, your employee, property manager, whoever. It's really important to have eyes on the property and, and see what's going on there um, so you can make sure those things are getting addressed. Right. Whatever they are. Um, so one of the things I like to ask about is maintenance and capital improvements. Um, we know that half of the half of the equation for valuing a, a multifamily property is the expenses, right? Sure. And, and that's I think one of the easiest things to kind of fly out of control. It, it, that's, that's one of the reasons that owners tend to try to manage their own properties is because they don't want you know, to have to hire the most expensive contractor or have extra charges that weren't nece- weren't necessary. So how have you approached maintenance and expenses at your property? How do you make sure that those are not getting out of control for you? Well, obviously, I think there again, my assistant plays a big role in that because we we do, you know, I mean, we bid our insurance annually, things like that. Uh, from the expense side, you know, wherever we wherever we think we have opportunities to to improve expenses. From from the capex side, I think what's what's really big and is often missed, especially in the small multifamily and single family space, is actually budgeting funds for it and actually having a schedule. Right? I mean, as an engineer, I mean, I can go through and say, okay, what things are are likely to need repair? Right? I mean, if you don't uh, flood the house. You know, the hardwood floors maybe need to be refinished once every 15 or 20 years, right? You know, just wear and tear on them. And that typically isn't a huge expense. I mean, roofs, I mean, you have to look and say, okay, you know, when I bought this thing, you know, how old was the roof? You know, do I want to maybe preemptively change the roof if it's already 15 years old, right, so that I don't have to worry about that? But you really do need to have a budget. And, you know, just like, I mean, Typically, you'll see in multifamily, they'll do this thing where they'll say, okay, we're going to assign $250 or $300 a door for CapEx. And that may or may not be accurate, but people just use these rules of thumb because they're real easy and they're real standardized. But typically, I mean, we we will build a maintenance plan. Like we have a, a standardized maintenance plan that we use for our single families. Like, okay, you know, a roof we have to plan every every 20 years, a furnace we have to plan every 20, 25 years you know, a certain amount for, you know, plumbing. We know that flooring is going to need it, you know. I mean, typically painting the exterior is considered to be CapEx, whereas painting the interior is considered to be, you know, just an expense. So, I mean, we we budget for those for those items. I mean, you, you, you could go real crazy with it. You could say, okay, I'm going to budget for, you know, every five years I have to, you know, replace my smoke detectors and that's going to cost me $250 every five years or whatever. I don't know that you need to go to that level of detail. But I think there's kind of a middle ground where I think a lot of investors don't even, you know, they, they see that money coming in every month and they say, oh, I got $400 of positive cash flow, right? And then all of a sudden they have to put on a roof and it's $8,000. It's like, well, okay, there went, you know, three years or whatever of your cash flow, right, if you haven't budgeted, right, to see what what you're really earning on that property, right? And I, I definitely think you want to hold reserves, you know, with a plan that, hey, you know, Maybe it ends up that the roof doesn't need to be replaced in 20 years and it lasts 25, but, you know, you want to have that plan in place to handle that so that you can cover those 
expenses where the, you know so that they don't become surprises i guess yep yeah that's huge i think uh, especially smaller investors they don't have a maintenance plan um or a schedule and so that's huge you know assessing each of those components of the house um by the way if you ever have had uh, an appraisal recently often that schedule of uh, life expectancy of those products are in the appraisal. So that's one one resource if you're not an engineer. <laughs> right, right, sure. <laughs> or you can just do some research online and kind of figure out um, how much life is on each of these components of your house and, and put together a budget. I think that's huge. And not many people do it. And unfortunately, I think the life expectancies of the products is going down. Mm-hmm. You know, um, wood windows that they put in my 130-year-old house lasted you know 80 years they don't work great when they're 80 years old but they're still there right and vinyl windows i've i've seen you know my experience is 15 years a lot of times you're replacing those vinyl windows every 10 to 15 years because i mean depending upon the grade of the window you buy right but of course as an investor what do they buy you know the I cheapest mean, thing yeah you you're gonna go and say oh they got them on sale for 90 bucks a piece at menards or whatever well the 90 dollar window is not the 300 hundred dollar window they just aren't mm-hmm. so yeah i mean i think you know for things i mean the list doesn't have to be very long i mean it could be you know your furnace your water heater your windows your roof your floors you know your exterior paint you know i mean you could get by with 15 items, right? You're not tracking 300 or 400 items. But if you plan for those items and you allocate, you know, and you have, basically you add it all up and you say, okay, that ends up being $225 a month for the single family house or $300 a month for the single family house. I mean, you should be really putting that money aside and not using it to buy, you know, daily expenses, right? Because it isn't real free cash flow. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah, actually putting the money, you know, in a savings account or some something else uh, where it's there when you need it. And I mean, if you have 20 rentals, maybe you don't have to hold 20 sets of reserves, right? You just say, okay, I'm going to keep $40,000 here on the side, you know. But but when you start drawing off of that, replenish it, mm-hmm. right? Right. And so now that you're in kind of a phase of, of selling these smaller properties, is there anything that you look back on and say, Man, if I had used a, a different grade of product or a different type of something, then it would have been a lot easier to get this property ready for sale. Um, I'm not sure about that, but interestingly enough, I've kind of, I, th- I think it was more of a business plan mistake for me, maybe, honestly. Um, way back when we started turning these things into rentals back in like 2009. Um, there was there was a banker who I knew at the time who had a really great financing program. He said, hey, just do light rehabs, get these things rent ready, get tenants into them. They'll be fine living there. They don't have to be absolutely perfect day one for a rental. And you can turn them in a month or two months, right? And I said, no, 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 no. I want to make them perfect so I have no maintenance issues, mm-hmm. right? Okay. So I spent four to six months on these things instead of one to two. And if I had done the one to two, I probably could have gotten four times as many. And then when we look at the appreciation that happened over the time period, um, you know, I I left millions on the table on that deal. Hmm. So I think, um, I actually think that it would have been better to not over improve. I mean, obviously, I think what I did helped me to get better tenants, right? So maybe less problems. But it kept my portfolio from really growing to where I, I would have liked to have seen it go because I was I was actually too picky. I was too too meticulous in what I was going to do, and and it just slowed slowed us down. Hmm. So that that's on the front end, I guess. As far as well, let, before you go on, I mean, I think that's an interesting topic to expand on because um, a lot of people did what you talked about. They just kind of did the bare minimum, put tenants in there. And then they might not have gotten the best tenants. So they might have spent more in turnovers as they had. I mean, you just mentioned how you have a lot of mm-hmm. long-term tenants. Mm-hmm. So I don't know. Wh- how, where's the balance, right? Cause I think you're right. I think there is a balance. Um, I'm not sure exactly where the balance is, but I think I think some of it is is cosmetics that, you know, maybe maybe we could do a certain amount of cosmetics that really attract the the better longer term tenants. You know, like refinishing the floors nice and 
maybe uh, you know new new countertops, maybe even granite countertops or whatever, because that's what we do put in all of our rentals is granite countertops. You know, and I could see where that would you know entice a good quality tenant. But I mean, we literally took the houses apart, you know, replaced the electrical and the plumbing and everything, even to the extent probably beyond what we needed to do just because we were like, well, we don't want anything to leak. We don't want anything to break. We don't want any, you know. And, I mean, it ended up being easier on the back end, I think, to sell the properties because then when we went in, we didn't have to do as big a rehab on the back end when we when we did go to sell them as I've been selling off my portfolio. But, yeah, I agree with you. I think there's there's a balance. You don't want to go, like, just, you know, so minimal that, you know, people walk into the place and don't want to live there, Mm -hmm. you know, but I think making them perfect is maybe too far for, for property when, especially when I I knew at that time that, you know, I was going to hold these as rentals for, you know, five to 10 years. I mean, that was day one, the goal. I knew that it wasn't going to be, you know, a rental for a year and then, and then sell it, you know, I mean, some, some people will use that strategy because they'll say, okay, if I do that, then I can, you know, get taxed at long-term gains rather than short-term gains, you know, sort of a, a tax strategy. But, yeah. But I knew that I was going to be, you know, five to, to ten years because I wanted to I wanted to capture the recovery in the market, and it actually recovered faster than I thought it would, you know. so Right, right. Well, that was good foresight on, on that point. Um, but, yeah, I don't know. I Obviously, like you said, you, you didn't grow as fast or as much as you could have, but I feel like um, – there's a lot of good in what you did do. Like you just said, um, when you're going to sell, there's not as much, uh, you know, construction um, components to work on. You just, you probably do got paint and clean. Yeah, so, more cosmetic, right. So it's a, it's a lot easier cosmetic turnover when you're getting it ready for sale. For sure. So, eh, interesting. Um, well, let's talk briefly about um, tenants and, and that relationship. Um, you know, at, you're kind of a, a landlord that's maybe a step away. Uh, well, you do uh, connect with them every 60 days or so, like you said, by phone. Um, but how do you balance, you know, uh, making the, allowing the tenants to know you're there, you care about the property, you, you have a level of care that they're satisfied at there. Um, but you're also, you know, have your eye on other aspects of your business and um, other things. So what's the balance in that relationship with the tenants? Well, I think for me there, again, it comes down to the uh, assistant that I have, right? Um, as far as, like, service, I always tell my tenants, hey, if you have an issue, you know, text me or my assistant, right? And I, I make a real strong effort to, you know, maybe we can't resolve that problem for two weeks, right? Maybe it's some really strange thing or some really big thing that needs to be resolved. But I always make sure that within, like, an hour of when they text, I respond and say, hey, I got your text. We're looking into it you know, letting them know that we are responding right away. I think I think that's really important. I think even in uh, larger apartment buildings, I think one of the, one of the things I, I read frequently in, in reviews where, you know, people are talking, especially like on Google, you know, now everybody reviews stuff on Google. But I hear over and over how tenants say, yeah, they they didn't care, you know. They didn't respond for a day, five days, you know, a week. And and then the second thing is, is follow up. Once you do respond, you know, keep your commitments, right? If you say, "Hey, I'm going to stop out tomorrow to look at this," don't just ghost them, you know. Um, actually, actually keep your word. And I think, uh, you know, I had issues with um, refrigerators for a couple of my tenants, and that's a really tough one, right? Because it's like it's all their food, right? And the food's going to rot and everything. And it was like. I think a couple of them happened on like holiday times or something. It was really, really difficult to get a replacement in there. And they were, they were frustrated that I couldn't respond right away, but they were really appreciative of the fact that I said, Hey, I know about it. I'm working on it. I'll get back to you at this point in time and let you know where we're at. And, you know, it took three days or something to get them a replacement refrigerator, which wasn't great, but I think they were really pleased in the end because I was just, I was responsive and I was honest and they felt like, okay, he cares, and he did his best, right? The outcome wasn't perfect, but the effort was, you know, made to try and do the best that I could for the tenant. Yeah. And I think that's I think that's really important in the relationship. Yep. Those refrigerator issues are, are really important. It's right there almost at an emergency where you, you have to respond quickly, otherwise there's damages, right? Yeah. Um, so that's, 
that's a great example there. Um, and, and you've, like I said, you've mentioned that um, you've had a lot of long-term tenants. Is there any key to that success of having people stay there long-term? Actually, I think there is one key, and it's counterintuitive. Uh, we don't do long-term leases. We do month-to-month leases. Okay. And I think because people never have that deadline in front of them, you know, typically what I do is I do month-to-month leases, and I give them three-month notices when a, when a, a rent increase is necessary, right? And I typically try to do the rent increases smaller and more frequent as opposed to larger and less frequent. Because then I think when people look at it and they say, oh, it's going up, you know, $40 a month on a $1,500 a month, you know, lease, they're not real motivated to move, right? And and if they're happy, I think the big thing is is they're happy with where they live. I think in, especially in single family and small multifamily, people tend to look at those more as homes, right? An apartment is an apartment, but when you're living in a duplex, a triplex, a single family home, I mean, they just kind of feel more like it's it's their home. And I, I also try to give them a little bit of latitude. You know, if they if they want to paint their bedroom red, and I think they're competent of painting it red without wrecking the trim or something like that, I'm going to let them do it because I just think it makes them feel more like they're at home, right? This is their home, so they they tend to stay longer. But I think definitely not having that hard end to the lease there. You know, it's like the lease could end every month, but, you know, people look at it and they go, oh, yeah, my one-year lease is up. You know, maybe I should go look for somewhere else. But usually the reason that I've seen like 90% of the time that people leave is actually because they felt like they were not being respected as a tenant. You know, their needs were not being addressed. And and I've found, you know, some tenants are really picky, but most are not. Mm-hmm. Most just want like basic things. It's like, okay, they want their heat to work in the winter. They want their AC to work in the summer. They want to have a, a working refrigerator. They want their, their lights to work and their toilet to flush properly. You know, I mean, it's really that basic, right? I mean, they're not... They don't have to have like the latest and greatest windows or, you know, perfectly unscratched floors or whatever. But, you know, just sort of having that baseline of things they use every day working properly. And when they don't work, you address it quick so they're back online again. You know, you, you let them know that you do care. I think that that's what tends to keep them. I mean, obviously, at some point, people change jobs or their family changes. They need a bigger place or whatever or a smaller place, you know, and, and that is, you know, eventually what tends to drive my tenants to, to leave. It isn't usually ever that they're unhappy about something. It's that they just have had a life change that basically makes it that they, they have to find another living arrangement. Yeah. Well, that's a really interesting example about the month-to-month leases. I know kind of Common thought on that, especially if you talk to a property manager, is that you should have at least a year lease, maybe year and a half, two year leases, because you want them to be locked in. Um, so I don't know. It's just a really interesting uh, perspective on it. Well, I think I think it may be more difficult in a big apartment building because you have so much un- potential uncertainty there. You know, uh, let's say they they built a new apartment building across the street, and it's the latest and greatest thing. And for whatever reason, they're only charging twenty five dollars a month more for rent. And all your tenants have month to month leases. You know, might ten of them go across the street? Maybe I, I don't know. I think it's just much harder for if you've got three hundred apartments you're managing in a complex to always have that potential that you know a whole bunch of people could leave. Uh, maybe daunting for a property manager. And I know, you know, in, in the apartment space, I mean, when you're talking about single family homes, if you've got 15 single family homes and they're spread out a little bit, right? I mean, that's a very different scenario than if you've got 300 units in this one complex, right? I mean, your absorption rate there, you may be limited to, you just can only get five in a month or 10 in a month, right? And all of a sudden 30 leave, you know, and and they want to have, you know, those those leases staggered, right? In fact, now uh, one of the strategies we look at, you know, in apartment complexes is to not necessarily even have the leases start on, you know, the first of the month and end on the end of the month, right? You actually even stagger them within the month so that, you know, you, your teams, whoever your team is that's doing the turnovers or whatever, they're not, you know, flooded on, you know, the, the 28th of the month or whatever, or the 30th of the month trying to turn 
you know, 10 units for the first of the next month, right? So a, a lot more planning there, right? That's kind of in the business planning, and that's why I can see that they would want to use, you know, the, the one-year leases to, to better manage that. Yeah. Well, and speaking from my experience where I used to be a property manager, um, not only did we have them all, you know, at the end of the month is when the lease would end, but um, usually in the summer months, typically, you know, maybe April through August, September. So you, that was kind of the the time of the year where you had to be on your game, ready for a lot of turnovers. Um, so, yeah, that's interesting. Um, I feel like it'd be a little complicated uh, having them staggered um, in the middle of the month, just from a, maybe a bookkeeping perspective, but definitely from a, a manpower as far as getting turnovers done, uh, that's definitely something to consider there. I think nowadays with uh, electronic payment and you know all the tools you have, computer tools you have to manage that stuff, it's not such a big deal anymore about what day of the month it all ends or sure. starts, right? Because hopefully most of it, you know, if, if you're in the ideal scenario, you would have your tenants paying online and, you know, everything would just sort of flow and you're just, you know, checking back and you can go in your system and say, okay, what 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 rents were due this week or whatever, and you, you can run a quick check and, you know, it becomes much easier when everything is in the, you know, the information age, if you will, you know, yeah. done electronically. Yep. I guess the other concern then would just be if you can have somebody move in, you know, usually most people move in the first. So if you got people moving out at staggered times, are you going to find everybody to plug into those ones? I don't know. I think there's always people in transition. And I think actually if you can offer an apartment on the eighth of the month rather than the first, you might pick up a tenant that somebody else, that the other buildings can't pick up, right? Because they're just not on that schedule, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, I'm not saying you want to have all of them, you know, in the middle of the month, but I think if you can stagger them, I think there's, advantages to it. And I also found it very interesting that um, typically when I had uh, properties that opened up in the middle of winter, like let's say January 15th and it's 20 below outside, and I'm either going to rent, rent that, re-rent that property or I'm going to sell that property, I had better results then than I had in June because I had no competition. Nobody else was there was nothing else available to rent. There was nothing turning. There was nothing else available to buy. There was the market was thin. Yep. Yeah, that's a good point too. There's people are always looking for a place to live, and so if the majority of the properties are are not available in the winter, and you have something that comes up, you you have an advantage there. So very neat. Um, let's uh, transition more into what you're doing now. Um, as you have decided to build up into larger properties, um, how have you approached bringing the right team members around you and making sure that you're making, you know, great partnerships and, and that there's good synergy with that going forward? I think, honestly, part of it, I, I have to say, was just luck or being blessed and the right person showing up at the right time. But um, I definitely communicate and network with a lot of people. I think networking is really important to getting to meet people, right, as potential partners, right? I think you you need to be uh, really in, intentional about looking at, you know, who those those people might be. And I think the other thing is I think sometimes people will see someone and they'll say, wow, this person would be a great asset on my team or a great partner, but they'll think, well, that person would never want to partner with me, right? I'm not good enough for that person, right? That person is further down the road from me or whatever. And what I found, you know, is that most people want to help other people, even if they don't express it. So I think you just really need to look out there. And when you see the right person, approach them. I mean, we've, especially now in the development space, I mean, we've approached some people who were just, you know, in, in our minds, they were the, the whales of the whales, right? And you think, well, this person will, will never even take a lunch with me, but I'm going to go ahead and call their secretary and see. And before you know it, you're having lunch and you're having a great conversation and they're very interested in, in working with you. You know, maybe they're, maybe they're somebody who typically builds 500 unit class A complexes and you say, well, we got this little project, you know, little by, by their perspective down in Greensboro. And 
and they're very interested in participating and helping. And a lot of times they're not even, you know, their first thought isn't, you know, hey, how much can I make off this, right? Their first thought is, hey, this is kind of neat and interesting and I can, I can help someone else come, coming up behind me, right? They're, they tend to be very much in that, in that mode. I think a lot of the more successful people actually have very much of what I would call the abundance mentality and they just are willing to help. So, I mean, I think, I think you have to take some serious thought into what the right partner looks like you know, assess where are your strengths, where are your weaknesses, you know, what are the things that that you you need to have to execute your business plan. And and then I think always go out and, you know, shoot shoot for the best. Okay. Yeah, that's neat. I mean ha- that abundance mindset I think is really important. Um a, a lot of people have it and not everybody does. A lot of people have scarcity mindset where I've got a keep everything tight and, and look out for my own. Um, but yeah, it's just amazing uh, how it can benefit everybody involved when you do have that abundance mindset. Right, for sure. Yeah, I mean, I've always been, and, and maybe that's what helps me is that people see that I have that mentality myself. So maybe somebody is more willing to help me because they've seen that I've been more willing to help somebody else. I don't know if anything plays into that, but... But definitely, I've been very blessed in finding my partners, at least over the, you know, since I've really stepped into the larger space over the last three, four years, I've just been able to connect with many amazing people and and work on projects with with people who I consider to have been, you know, I'm not the smartest guy in the room. I'm the dumbest guy in the room, you know, that kind of scenario. And, uh, and of course, I'm a sponge, so I've, I've learned a lot. But yeah, definitely, I think uh, um, LinkedIn has been a real asset to me. I mean, it's amazing how um, you can connect with someone through LinkedIn and, and actually start a personal conversation that way, whereas you may have no hope of ever connecting with them otherwise, right? Especially if they're in the corporate world. I mean, you're not going to, you know, you call up their secretary, their secretary isn't even going to tell them that you called, you know, to try and get a phone call with them, right? But for some reason, people in, in those positions will respond on on LinkedIn. So I found, you know, that's how I found my partner in Greensboro. Uh, I was just looking through LinkedIn and um, he looked like somebody who fit the bill for what I was interested in. And I was very interested in that market. And so I just blindly reached out to him and he reached back and we started talking and we connected and we actually, um, you know, worked together, you know, via like Zoom conferences and phone calls for for I think four months on this project before we actually got in the same room together and we ended up connecting at a conference in Boston for the very first time. But it was like we got there and we almost felt like it was like family almost by that point in time. But that whole relationship had just started because I reached out on LinkedIn. Yeah. Well, I, I know LinkedIn has become popular as kind of the comeback social media thing, the next thing. Um, but there's a big difference between, uh, you know, Everybody's going to it now, and they want to sell you their product. But but you're going to people with an opportunity. I think there's. I would guess there was probably a different way that you approached this person than uh, kind of just selling him something. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, I I basically try to offer, like you said, opportunity. I guess the way I approached Jerome there is, I said, "Hey, I'm very interested in in the Greensboro market." You know, it looks like you're a real expert on it and you're real active there. Um, maybe, you know, I have some some things that I might be able to offer to a partnership and I'm interested in investing, you know, um, would you be interested in working with me on an investment, right? Some, try, try to present, you know, try to give something before asking for something back. I think mm-hmm. that's really important. That's a really good point that, that you bring up. I think, uh, you know, some people now, I think because we're, we think in sort of that mass media world, you know, how, how can I reach 10,000 people in two hours, right? <laughs> right. Um, I think it's real common now that people have discovered that, hey, if, you know, especially like in the, in, in the like uh, education to investor space, I think people are, are finding that, hey, if I, you know, provide something of value. And, and a lot of people now are writing like short books and things like that on topics and things like that and saying, hey, come, to, you know, come to my website and, you know, you can get your free book here, right? You can sign up and give me your, your name and your email address and get your book. And then they, and then they follow up. But, 
I mean, whether it's on LinkedIn or whether it's, you know, face to face over a lunch or through a meetup group or whatever, I mean, it still comes down to human nature that's never changed in 2000 years, right? I mean, you really need to have a personal relationship with somebody, right? It's, uh, you know, that that tried and true thing of no like trust, right? And that's that's how you build relationships. You get to know, you get to like, you get to trust. And that, that, you know, so whatever the platform, I mean, you're not going to get 50,000 investors on LinkedIn just by, you know, sending out a whole bunch of connection requests, right? I mean, that's just human nature. Anybody who thinks that that's going to work is going to fail. It really just comes down to, um, I tend to always approach things with an abundance mentality. I try to always give before taking. And uh, I look for, you know, commonality and, and connection, like friendship. Like, can, can we work together? Are we similar personalities? Are we two people who, who are going to, who are going to, you know, meld together? Like almost like you're looking for a friend rather than a business partner first. Hmm. Yeah. Well, that's great. So, and then from a high level um, perspective, you've decided to kind of shift your focus as we've touched on selling those small properties and going into kind of a market that you see not as many people are going into. And we'll try not to tell too many people about it. But um, so then as you kind of plan to do well in this market, of course, how are you doing, you know, what goes into that planning process to make sure you're successful? Well, I think fortunately for me in that space, someone else had done the very first prototype. So I was able to look at what they had done and how they had achieved it. And, and partner with them on the second one. But um, I think for me, it really comes down to understanding, well, first you have to understand the need, right? Are you, I mean, it goes back to like basic business planning, right? You know, I mean, it doesn't matter if you're, if you're Amazon.com or if you're Microsoft or if you're Dave Peters starting a new business, you really have to like meet a need or desire of, of people, right? So, um, I had to kind of step back and say, okay, is this space viable? Is this something that's really needed? You know, and do some research on it and, and talk to people, you know, who are in the industry. Maybe some of the, there's a few people, you know, it's a, it's a budding early industry and there's a few people in there already. So I, um, you know, there's actually one group that's doing trainings on this stuff now. So I went to their, went to their training and met all the other people that were there who were, you know, early on and talk to them about, you know, their successes and failures and, and what was really driving it, did some more research. Actually, I mean, I went and talked to, uh, with my partner, we went and talked to some uh, chamber of commerce people. We went and talked to economic development people in a couple cities, you know, just really tried to lay the foundation and, and build out what the demand model would look like and say, okay, there is the demand. We determined there is the de demand. Well, how's that demand being met now? And can we provide a better solution? Mm -hmm. Okay. Before you go on, uh, that's interesting. You brought up talking to the local governments. Um, are they liking this idea or are they opposed to it? I know there's a lot of talk about short-term rentals and kind of some pushback and people creating or cities creating new ordinances. I don't know how this falls into that kind of short term, but actually they've been super receptive. I think because they realize that, I mean, the model is based on a forward thinking mobile economy, right? People are moving around more and more and more, right? It isn't, you know, it isn't your dad's economy or your grandpa's economy where somebody will stay in a job for 30 years, right? So with people always in transition, th there is a need to fill that space and the need is becoming even more and more. And I think the, the, the cities are also looking at it as like, well, this is, you know, a potential type of housing that could, that could help out in urgent situations for people as well, right? Let's say, you know, family loses their home or whatever they can they can utilize that it isn't you know so much like i mean i think most cities probably look at airbnb as like well that's sort of a a luxury it's a vacation type thing right you know and airbnb typically i mean from what i've read i think this the typical stay is like three days right it's not six months i mean they certainly they have people who do it for six months right but that's not the typical scenario this is this is really looking at an economic development business space and a a real like almost emergency housing need space 
you know. Okay. So it, it's it's very different than, I mean, could Airbnb fill some of this? Yes, it could, but your typical Airbnb, I mean, there are some professional Airbnbs, right? Like they may have, they may buy, uh, you know, a, a building, even an apartment building and convert it to 50% Airbnb or something like that. But I think that tends to be looked at as very, that's like almost too transient and it tends to be more like, oh, okay, these are people who are looking to have a, a good time and have a party in a place and, you know, they're going to be maybe loud or whatever, you know, disruptive to the neighborhood or whatever. It's not, you know, professionals or people, you know, in jobs where they where they need to be in different locations or, you know, in, in one city we're looking at, um, they actually have a huge uh, construction project they're trying to do and they're going to have probably a thousand extra construction workers in that city for for five years hmm. and so okay where are these people going to go because they're not necessarily while they're going to be there five years it's not like the same construction worker is going to be there for five years straight right so you don't just put them in traditional housing it tends to be different groups of people waves of people coming in to do various portions of the operation you know as the as the job progresses and so there's always going to be a need for a certain amount of you know okay this guy needs a place to stay for two three months right so, I mean, the cities, and, and the other thing is the resources that we are using to provide that housing are currently, tend to be underutilized. They tend to be sort of the eyesores of the neighborhood a lot of times. You know, they're, they're rundown buildings. They're things that, you know, we come in and say, hey, we're going to, we're going to reinfuse some money and we're going to improve this. You know, we're going to, we're going to bring more life into this, into this asset. And then, of course, if we actually are successful in our business plan, you know, they're going to come back and say, oh, gee, uh, you guys are like, you know, 90 percent occupied, not 30. You know, so you, you know where that goes. Right. I mean, they're, they're going to be able to get a little bit more tax base, too. Hmm. Yeah, for sure. So you talked about uh, identifying that or confirming that there is a need for this. Uh, there's a demand for it and that the cities are generally open to it. Mm -hmm. um, any what's kind of the next step in in planning out this business to make sure it's going to be viable for you? Well, I think actually one of the big next steps is to slowly build an investor base because obviously in order to make the dream come true, it takes capital. And it because it's a little bit different space, I think people initially are going to be a little bit concerned because it's a newer model, right? I mean, multifamily is so established and everybody says, oh, multifamily is quote unquote safe. I, I won't necessarily argue for or against that comment, but um, I think that uh, people just have to learn about what this industry is and where that demand is, because I think that demand is a little bit hidden from the common eye. It's not, you know, the average person doesn't realize how much demand there is for these services. And so um, I think we need to get investor education. Um, we obviously need to build, you know, a really in-depth business plan, which we're working on now, literally line by line, because we're going to be addressing, you know, all of our revenue side, you know, which, which comes, the revenue side comes a lot to marketing. You know, we have to get to the customer base, right? And then on the expense side, we have to, you know, plan, okay, the operations, you know, and, and we're looking at, you know, operating differently than, you know, a, a traditional uh, asset you know, kind of in a, in, a, in a hybrid space and try to try to make sure that we fully understand how to optimize, you know, who is, we, we, I mean, we have really good job descriptions now for all the roles that are involved in the business and stuff like that. And figuring out how to find the right person to fill those roles, I think is, is challenging, especially when we're looking at assets that, you know, some of them are going to be local to where we are now. That's kind of our initial test bed. We're doing local assets, but we're also reaching out further and further. And as we reach further and further, we have to be able to more and more rely on those on-site people to execute their roles. So I think there's, you know, we have to build good, find the right people and build good training programs for those people to make sure because it really is, you know, in multifamily, this is true too. I mean, the key, the biggest key to a, to a successful multifamily really is the property manager, that person who's there every day, who's the top person on site, you know, and that's going to be true in this model too. Yeah. Well, you've, you've touched on a lot of things there that I want to kind of pull on if I can. So for one, uh, the investor base, that's, that's huge. And especially going from maybe a smaller model where 
I don't know if you had investors with your smaller properties, mm-hmm. um, but talk briefly about um, what it's like to to pull in investors to your deals. Okay, well, I think first of all, um, I've been building an investor base for three years, which is you know the process that I talked to you about with with the same with almost like the getting to know the tenants, right, or getting to know the key players, right, the principals and the team. Um, you build relationships. Um, I think it's really important to be able to demonstrate real credibility with people, you know. And I think it's kind of interesting in the in the multifamily industry. Uh, one of the the big things they use is they use the you know well I'm involved in a thousand doors or I I own a thousand doors well what does that exactly mean right it can mean a lot of different things it's not it's not real definitive right but I've been you know getting to know people for the last three years demonstrating you know my skill set my ability um, not only in the real estate space but in the business you know space as well showing that you know hey I have a lot of business acumen I have a lot of experience in in successfully building businesses and in successfully turning around businesses that that we're not doing well so you you just build those relationships and from those relationships you know and most of those relationships honestly were built around the the multifamily model of investing right I have to be able to re-educate those investors and that and that's just a process I think I think it really helps to have a working model. You know, we have one very successful property now. We have another that we're taking over very soon that I believe will will turn around very quickly. And I think as we have a few of those to demonstrate, I think that the track record very, you know, in the exact model that we're working in is going to be very important to the educational process of the investor. And I think the other thing is, you know, you, you put together a really good business plan and then you simplify it for the investor you really strip it down to to the bare bones and if they want more information you allow them to to dig in deeper and if if they are comfortable where they're at then then you allow them to come in but we actually probably invest as much effort in screening our investors as we do our partners because we want to make sure that First of all, the, that the investment that we're offering to them is the right investment for them, right? I mean, does it make sense for their family? Does it make sense with their current financial situation? You know, we never want someone to overcommit to an investment, right? You know, we don't want to be, you know, taking 50% of grandma's wealth and putting it in, even if we believe that, you know, we're going to provide a huge return for grandma and that the, the risk is a very good, you know, the risk reward is very good. And I think that's something that we talk about a lot that maybe other people don't is, risk adjusted reward you know mm-hmm. because definitely i mean you can promise somebody some really high returns but then you kind of maybe don't emphasize enough that well you know there's a 50% chance that you could actually lose all your money or a 20% chance that you could actually lose all your money right because typically the highest rewards come with the highest risk so you really yep. have to do a risk adjusted reward yep that's for sure and obviously in the, in this particular show we don't talk a lot about Raising capital, that's a huge topic in and of itself, but just wanted to get your uh, brief thought on that. Sure. Um, and then um, going back to the uh, short-term uh, operations expenses, I can speak from experience having one short-term rental myself that you do have to just kind of be on your game a lot more uh, compared to a, a long-term tenant. Uh, you know, if, if they're only there for a short period of time and, and something goes wrong, you you want to like, you know, double down on your customer service and your responsiveness and and ability to fix things promptly. So, I know that, uh, you know, in your space, kind of medium term rental is maybe some mixture of there. What does it look like to have that um, the operations uh, and, and responsiveness in those mid term rentals? Sure, sure. Yeah. No, actually, uh, the way we have our model set up is we will have probably two people that are on site every day at those locations, okay? Uh, A property manager and a maintenance-related person. And in addition to those people, we are going to have uh, what you would call a caretaker. So there will be somebody available 24 hours a day, plus, you know, they'll have access to, to our team, to the property manager, you know, essentially 24 hours a day. That's going to be something that, you know, it's going to be part of the property manager's job is sort of, you know, being on call, somebody's going to be on call 
24 hours a day, even if there isn't staff there. So actually, we will be um, better staff than a typical multifamily, yeah, because you, you do need to have someone. And, and the caretaker role that, that we have planned out, actually, that, that person will, will live on site and they will, you know, do other jobs like um, they'll be there to make sure that, you know, the garbage is handled properly, you know, that there's no issues. And, you, you know, I mean, we, we do have a lot of security at these at these sites. Now, it's very inexpensive to install lots of lighting and install lots of cameras because, I mean, safety is huge with, with people. I mean, it doesn't matter if it's multifamily, it's a hotel, it's something in between, it's an Airbnb, whatever. Safety is huge, right? I mean, that's the first thing that is going to detract, you know, take people away from your property. So, so we'll have the ability to remotely monitor everything that's that's going on at the property. You know, we're building relationships with uh, local police departments to make sure that, you know, if there's any issues, we can get really good response time, you know, have really good relationships. We want to make sure that we keep the properties very safe. And, th and then the caretaker's role beyond that is to keep the property, you know, safe and desirable, you know. So part of their role will be things like, you know, vacuuming the hallways and things like that and just just it, overall just sort of being you know what what is a caretaker it's someone who takes care of right and i think that role is really key in addition to the the property manager and the maintenance person and we do have um within our business plan we have that uh you know desired one hour touch time in other words within an hour of when somebody reports something you know and there'll be multiple ways that they can report it i mean they can text it in they can, you know, we're going to have a, a website where they can put in a, a maintenance issue request or they can call a person on the on the phone. And we haven't decided yet, but possibly as we build up these assets, we may have, um, there's, there's some really reasonable virtual assistant programs that you can use to have, you know, a 24-hour day live operator, right? Let's say we have 10 of these assets operating and each one of them would have a different phone number. So, when they would call in to, you know, this operator who's basically there, you know, they're scheduled 24 hours, well, not 24 hours a day, but whenever we don't have live staff available, let's say we have a person there 10 hours a day, that the other 14, they would actually be get, able to get to a human being who would then be able to get to one of us, you know, so yep. that there would be instant response time. I mean, I think that's, that's one of the things I've seen some real... Uh, more advanced multifamily operators do is leverage like the Philippines virtual assistants to provide, you know, and, and one of the ways they do it is another way that we need to do it is let's say someone calls at one o'clock in the morning. Why would you call at one o'clock in the morning to, to try to get a, you know, a two week stay or a month stay somewhere, but somebody might, right? And we want to be able to respond back to them quickly, right? Because I think that response time is so key. I think I read somewhere, this is talking about multifamily now, but if you can respond within 90 minutes, the likelihood of actually getting that customer goes up by like 40 or 50%. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's that's huge. Um, I was just looking at uh, into the virtual assistant uh, deal just the other day. So it's so amazing what uh, what people, what's available out there. Well, that is really interesting. Um, you know, obviously, we've only scratched the surface of this business here, and there's a lot more to go over. But kind of just in the interest of time, I think we should wrap things up here. Um, any kind of closing thoughts about business planning and what my audience can take away from what you've learned and, and kind of implement that and keep that in mind? Gosh, I think there's probably two things that, that I think of. The, the first is that you can't repeal human nature. Humans are always going to be humans. Um, understand how to build relationships with people. Um, always, always work from. Uh, I think an abundance mentality will take you twice as far, twice as fast. I think that's the first thing. Always remember that, no, no matter where you're working or what you're doing or or, or what you're looking at, ultimately it, it all boils down at some point to human to human interaction, right? Whether it's a banker, whether it's an employee, whether it's a you know a customer, it's always going to boil down to human to human interaction, and I think that's always important to to remember that and to always try to take forward that that abundance mentality toward everyone. Sometimes it can be hard, you know, because if somebody's adversarial to you, it, it can be hard to still be 
kind in response. But I think that's that's really important. And I think the the second thing is to try as much as possible to think about always how can I replace myself in the business? Well, how do you replace yourself? You create processes and systems, right? So I think creating processes and systems all the time, it's it's painful up front. We'd rather just go, go, go. Rather, you know, let's do it rather than sit there and try to try to build a process and a system. But I think in the long run, as you build, you'll find that the processes and systems will help you to to build much faster because what you can do is you can turn those processes and systems actually into you know, even short YouTube videos, and you can then, you know, you have that documented forever, right? So then the, the next person comes along, your new manager at your new location or whatever, you have a whole set of processes and procedures with these YouTube videos that they can watch. And I think people tend to be, um, especially in this generation, they tend to be very, um, uh, what's the word? Just visual. Visual, yeah. Yeah, so they would much rather watch a short video of someone talking about something and showing something than to pull out a procedures manual and try to read procedural stuff out of a manual. Yep. Have you by chance read the book Clockwork? I've heard of it. I haven't read it. I think he, I believe it's that book where he talks just about that. You need to have all your systems documented, but do it in video so that it's easily made. And then when you make changes, it's easily updated. Just have the next person that's in charge make a new video, and then it's it's ready to go for the next person. So, yeah, no, I think that's great. And now the technology is there, right? Where it's like twenty years ago, how would you have made a video? I mean, it just wouldn't have been practical, right? Sure. I mean, you took a pro you know professional studio to make a video, but now I mean, you can do it on your cell phone, right? You yep. Just pick up your cell phone, talk yep. away, and there you go. Yep. I mean, even I'm making videos. <laughs> yeah. Right. <laughs> So, all right, well, wonderful. So I just have a couple of closing questions uh, to allow the audience to get to know you a little bit better. And uh, first one is, uh, why do you get up in the morning? Um, I think uh, probably my God, my family, my friends, in that order. Okay. Um, I, I wake up most mornings and I'm just grateful. I'm just grateful for the country we live in. I'm grateful for the place that I live in. I'm grateful for my family that I have. You know, I'm just grateful. And I think uh, I want to take the the talents and skills that I've been given and use them to make to make this a better place to live. You know, whether that's, you know, the small things or the big things, right? I mean, it could be getting up in the morning to help my daughter with her math homework that she's struggling with, right? You know, I mean, that's really important too, right? It's just as important as, you know, maybe making plans to build a new apartment building, you know? So I think that's that's what motivates me and gets me out of bed. I think I I love what I'm doing. I've been given the opportunity to take the, the skills and talents I have and apply it in an area that just really excites me. And I think, you know, it's kind of that, that old cliche thing. They always say, well, everybody needs a place to live, right? Yep. So, mm -hmm. so it really motivates me every day to try and maybe find better ways to provide that. Nice. Very good. And the second question I have is what event or person in your history has been monumental in changing or creating who you are today? Hmm. I think probably my mom. I think my mom always encouraged me to be willing to, you know, look at things from a different perspective. You know, I mean, a lot of things in society tend to be really structured. You know, they kind of teach you as you're growing up, well, you're going to go to grade school and you're going to go to college and then you're going to get the job and you know, you're going to work for 30 years in your industry and you're going to save money into your 401k or whatever. You know, sort of that life plan, right? But my mom was always, I was always sort of different. I was always the kid who was off doing something else and everybody was doing something. And my mom always kind of encouraged me that, hey, that's okay, you know, be your own person. Just always be be kind and, and use your talents to the best you can. Very good. Nice. Um, and then kind of last question is, uh, what's the best way for people to get in touch with you if they'd like to do that? Oh, sure. Um, I'm, I'm fine with people calling or texting. You could reach me at my phone number, which is 612-998-5500. I also watch my email fairly closely. That would be david, D-A-V-I-D, period, P-E-T-E-R-S at A-D-Z 
E-R-V-I-O.com. Okay. And we'll put that in the show notes. If anybody didn't catch it there, they can look there. Um, That's great. Thank you. So, all right. Well, wonderful, David. I really appreciate you coming in, spending some time with us, sharing your knowledge. Um, just a small token of my appreciation is this maximizing your property value mug. Nice. And a quick poll I'm taking here. Are you more likely to put coffee or hot chocolate or something else in there? Tea. Tea. Green, green tea. Organic green tea with honey. All right. Very good. Well, again, thank you so much. And uh, to our audience, thank you so much for tuning in. I hope you enjoyed this episode. Uh, be sure to share it out. Comment below if you have any comments or, or uh, questions, feedback. Love to hear from you. And we'll catch you next time. Yeah, thank you so much, John. Thanks. The opinions shared on this show are for informational purposes only and should not be taken as a solicitation for representation or investments in any specific offering. Please consult with your financial, legal, tax, and real estate advisor before making any investment decisions. John Stiles is a licensed Minnesota real estate agent with Bridge Realty. Thanks for tuning in to Maximizing Your Property Value, the apartment owner's guide to operating rental properties as a successful business. If you're considering scaling up, downsizing, or right-sizing your real estate investment portfolio, it's important to know how to determine your property's value in today's market. That's why I've put together a free ebook for you called How to Calculate Your Investment Property's Value. To get your copy, go to www.realestatestyles.com forward slash value. Now, if you found any value in today's show, be sure to subscribe to our email newsletter, YouTube channel, and podcast through your favorite podcast player. All the links are in the show notes. And would you do me a big favor? Help me get the word out about this show by sharing with your friends on Facebook and LinkedIn. And lastly, we appreciate your five-star rating on iTunes. I really appreciate you and wish you the best in your real estate investing career. Signing off, I'm John Stiles with Bridge Realty. Make it a great day.